Are there any questions or comments from committee members before we proceed with the first item on today's agenda? Okay, I have to give it a little extra time for you to unmute there, so there might be a slight pause, a little more than normal with my usually pretty rapid fire speaking style. Seeing none, I'd like to address the committee kind of what's happening here with COVID and why I asked committee members to stay out for today. Uh, we've had a spike in some positive cases, uh, more on the Senate side in the last couple days. Um, so with having some staff that actually have some significant concerns based on age and, and health um, items, what I'm trying to do is uh, make sure that I'm taking care of uh, the staff that have uh, significant concerns so that they don't have to be in the room here together, uh, trying to show that we can actually operate. We have a resolution that the Senate passed unanimously to allow us to operate remotely so that we would not be blocked from getting the work done. Unfortunately, that uh, resolution is languishing in the House, and so until the House decides to pick up that resolution and pass it, we're going to continue to force people to be in this Petri dish of the legislature um, or inside this legislative building where there are at-risk folks that are having to come in to do their work because there's things we cannot do remotely. It happened last week in this committee. We had an issue where we didn't have enough people, so bills just sat. We couldn't move them. And uh, the point is to try to get to a point where we can pass that resolution and allow us to still continue to do the work we are here to do to pass bills and to get things done, but also allow people that are vulnerable or sick or have had close contact, whatever it is, to still be you know, in their apartment or whatever and work and not be shut down. And we're kind of seeing that happening here right now. So we're kind of taking this little step here today that's a little different, but I hope it will become crystal clear that we can do better than this. Um, and uh, this is going to show, I think, today that we're going to hopefully be effective and a remote operating bill would allow us to work. And so uh, we've been working on this, by the way, folks, for over a year right now. And I've said that several times before. Uh, we have some issues of, and I want to bring this on the record because my staff is sitting to my right here. His wife works as a charge nurse on one of the leading COVID floors for over a year now in Oregon. And he told her what was happening here, and her comment was very crystal clear. It's like, and I'm going to use the exact language, you guys are stupid. And her point was, is that um, when we bring in these masks, for example, testing and all that stuff is not really helping. We still have it in the building. And she's like, these masks we're wearing, she's like, they would they force them to take them off, and they have to put on an N95 mask or better. They have to put on goggles because they know there's transmission of it, you know, into the eyes, et cetera. That's, this is coming from them, not me. I'm not a nurse or a doctor and a face shield and then the you know the gowns and the gloves and the whole thing well we're not going to do that here that's pretty clear that'd be impossible to get us to try to work like that so we kind of have half measures that are getting into this point we're forcing people to come in that have vulnerabilities and um so we're either gonna have to do one thing or the other is my point and as opposed to forcing people to come into close contact quarters here um again this goes mostly back to folks saying look the house get the resolution passed so we can operate and we can do our business, and those that get sick, have close contact, whatever, um, we can still operate without being shut down. Last year, folks, I remind you, the legislature took itself out of the game. We benched ourselves last March, and we were not a part of the process for appropriating money, all the CARES Act funding, um, emergency declarations, all those things. We did not come back together as a legislative body to do the business, and I think we can do better than that. So just to be clear again, I want to make it crystal clear that I've asked the committee members to stay out today for those reasons. Um, I called all of them, and they were okay with staying based on my request, not theirs. It was mine. Um, and we are going to hopefully look at mitigation measures, um, but if the House will pick up this resolution, I think we'll find a way that we can allow ourselves to do business without making people um, that are vulnerable have to come in here and work. Uh, so we're in kind of weird, uncharted territories. Uh, trying to work our way through this and hopefully prove to people that we can operate on teams and other things and allow people that have vulnerabilities to not be here. So that's my kind of five minute opening speech. I thought it was important to address why today to do this, but there are reasons that are driving it and I want it to be crystal clear. So uh, thank you. And just to be clear, Terrence, did I miss anything out of that? Okay, for why we're, why we're here today on, in this strange setup. Okay. Um, Thank you for listening to that. We're going to move on to the first item on today's agenda. It's going to be SB 95, Search and Rescue Surplus State Property, sponsored by Senator Wilson, who's online with us, has staff in, in the room, uh, one staff, if uh, needed to come up and testify. Uh, as we're remotely operating the committee, we'd like to remind everybody on the public watching that you may submit written testimony regarding SB 95 to my committee aide um, and our uh, office at SSTA, that's Sierra, Sierra Tango Alpha, at akleg.gov. As a note for the committee, today we're going to have the following people with us for invited testimony and or answering questions. So far, we only have 
one with us, but we do have Senator Wilson online. We have Jasmine Martin, staff to Senator Wilson. We have uh, Paul uh, Fussy. I hope I got that right, Paul. Lieutenant Search and Rescue Coordinator for DPS. And uh, we don't have anybody else. They may pop up online as we need them. So, Senator Wilson, when you're ready, please introduce yourself for the record and uh, walk us through the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? You're loud and clear, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I do believe there's uh, we have four of you from the Department of Administration also on teams uh, joining us, I believe, for uh, Senate Bill 95. And for the record, this is Senator David Wilson, Senator for District D. And online, I have my trustee staff, Ms. Jasmine Martin. And in the room, I believe Ms. Jody Simpson is there. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, Senate Bill 24 is an act relating to the right of first refusal for our search and rescue groups uh, to, with the respect of the surplus state property. As Alaskans, we're mostly outdoor folks. Some of us, and someday, possibly have or may require party. By statute, the state troopers are required to lead the search and rescue efforts in the state, and this mission heavily revised heavily relies on over 1,100 search and rescue volunteers across this great state, Mr. Chair. Many of these groups are purely volunteer and receive little financial support from the state, and some of their expenses can be reimbursed, such as, fuse, such as fuel costs, but they, in general, don't receive compensation for their services. We've seen many examples of search and rescue volunteer groups in the news. These groups provide invaluable support during the Haynes avalanche this year, the floods that have occurred in Lower Yukon, and on Bear Mountain. This bill provides a small assistance to these groups at no cost to the state. It allows organized volunteer search and rescue groups in the state to exercise the right of first refusal for state property related to search and rescue services before it is sent to state auction or otherwise disposed of. The right of first refusal means that these groups will be given the opportunity to buy the equipment at fair market uh, price set by the Department of Administration before it goes to the general public would have access to it. This is a small way to provide help in these tight budget times to these volunteer organizations to provide such a valuable service to our state Again, this bill has a zero physical note uh, from the Department of Administration, and would thank you for uh, considering this legislation. And again, online, I think we do have someone from the Department of Administration to answer questions. And uh, uh, you know, as you said, we do have Lieutenant Fussy for the Department of Public Safety. And if the committee has any questions, we can do a quick sectional analysis with uh, Ms. Martin. Okay, thank you, Senator Wilson. Let's go ahead and do that just to get that out in the open, and then we'll go with the questions after that. So yeah, this is uh, uh, Jasmine Martin, staff to Senator Wilson for the record. Uh, can everyone hear me? I'm clear, Jasmine, thanks. All right, perfect, thank you. Uh, so this is just a two-section bill. Section 1 uh, names this act the Ellie May Act, and Section 2 amends AS 4466110, which is our statutes dealing with disposition of state property. Um, and it just inserts in there that uh, volunteer search and rescue groups uh, can exercise right of first refusal uh, to the disposition of state property. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jasmine. And just for the record, to make sure I got it right, early on, Senator Wilson, I think he said SB 24 uh, when he started talking. Oh. I just want to make sure it's actually SB 95 for the yeah. record. It's okay. I just want to make yes. sure it's clear. So, okay. I too many bills. Yeah, I get it. I, I do the same thing. So, um, uh, at least it's not Senate Bill 44, right? Because then it could be 44 backwards, and then, no, just kidding. Not going to go there. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to open it up at this time to the committee um, if we have questions. And, of course, the Senator Wilson is staff, and we have those other experts. So I'm just going to start with the online. If you have one, hand is great, or you can unmute. And I see uh, Senator Holland. Go ahead, sir. I just want to say this is a great idea. Um, I used to work at a federal facility down in Louisiana decades ago, and um, we had access to uh, uh, military surplus and I mean just the the my big concern was um, that there were organizations volunteer organizations that did not have the same access to a lot of that but I, th I just want to say I think it's a great idea appreciate the bill thanks Senator Holland just a reminder don't forget to oh I can see you unmute yourself now it shows up ah, learn as we go other questions from committee at this time 
Can I just do a nonverbal? Uh, yep, go ahead. I see a thumbs up. There. And a rhyme ball, so that's a support. <laughs> and I will say it is nice to see smiling faces, actually human faces, not behind a mask. I guess that's maybe one weird benefit of doing this on Teams at the moment. Uh, of course, you can't see mine, but I can see yours. Great. Uh, do Senator Wilson, do you think it's uh, germane at all to have any of your experts that would have anything to add, or are they really just okay for questions? If there's anybody that wants to add from that's uh, an expert testimony, it would be a good time to do it. I'm going to take that as a no. Uh, don't sound like any, it does not sound like anybody has anything to add. Okay, then uh, if that being the case, then what my plan is here, um, we're going to, with no further questions from the committee, uh, we're going to thank you, Senator Wilson's staff and those others that came online. You can, of course, clear yourself off uh, so you don't have to wait for the rest of the meeting. I would like to thank everybody for that. Amendments for SB 95 will be open until Friday, March 19th at 5 p.m. You can submit those to our uh, committee aid, and I believe you might have had a few as well. We'll just take them up at the same time, Senator Wilson, if that's okay with you. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, and if I can just briefly just, uh, just state for the record what those uh, two amendments might be. Please, go ahead. Yeah. Uh-oh. Have been uh, just they're both still a little bit amendment that would have state uh, following. I would just clarify that this bill only applies for state property and not federal or other property that the state may be disposing of. And uh, our second amendment would uh, have the word obsolete following two on page one, line 10. And this would just be a uh, title. Uh, conform to be more completely uh, to more complete the language of the bill just technical items okay thanks senator wilson i just want to uh, we just get them all done at once i don't anticipate many and we'll probably just uh, you know look to get them all passed in one fell swoop there so and with uh, as long as you're okay with that we'll move on and set this one aside for now yes thank you thanks senator wilson for showing up today so uh, we'll clear off that staff and we'll take up the bill at a, a future meeting to uh, finish up the work on it as a reminder if you did not get a chance uh, to call in, you have written testimony. Like I said, Senate State Affairs, SSTA at AKLG.gov. Okay, we are going to uh, uh, now move on to the next item, SB 66, members of Ledge Council, Ledge Button Audit, sponsored by Senator Begich. And who do we have? What's that? You have me, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Senator Begich, I can hear you. There you are. Okay, great. Uh, do, you, do you have a staff member that's going to either be here back in the chairs or um, online that we have? Online, uh, I'll be joined by uh, Mercedes Colbert. What I'll do is when I'm done with a little description of the bill, I'll mask up and go off to another corner. She'll come in and, and present the very quick sectional with some commentary on the sectional. Got it. Okay, so a little different because we're operating online through video. Uh, We'll have you guys on the record. Thanks for the explanation. Makes sense. Senator Begich, uh, I want to inform the committee that Senator Begich's office and mine have had previous conversations about the bill. Uh, after the conversation, Senator Begich and I agreed the best way forward for the sake of process was to introduce a committee substitute for SB 66, Senate Bill 66, which has made minor check, uh, changes to Section 1 and 2 and eliminated Section 3 from the original version. Um, once Senator Begich has read through a sponsor statement and given an introduction to SB 66, and we've gone through the sectional analysis with staff, We'll move the CS for Senate Bill 66, uh, Senate Bill 66. Staff to Senator Begich will briefly walk us through the explanation of changes. I'll object for the purpose of that. Uh, and then we will bring Senator Begich's staff back to answer questions from the committee members. Senator Begich, does that sound good to you? Sounds perfect to me. All right, sir, when you're ready, go ahead and put yourself on the record. Please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Begich. I'm the state senator for District J, downtown Anchorage. The bill before us, SB 66, is a bill designed to impact the uh, membership of the Legislative Council and the Legislative Budget and Audit Committee. Uh, many of you are familiar with these committees. Some of you actually sit on these committees as well. These committees perform, as you know, a needed and necessary uh, component of the work we do. When we're not in session, the Legislative Budget and Audit Committee acts as, as it were as something of a finance committee for the uh, for the body. And when the um, when the Ledge Council meets, it meets often representing the entire state on issues and matters of constitutional importance, as well as how we function and run the operations of the legislature. 
Because of this, and because our work must continue at all times, it's important that these committees represent all Alaskans. However, that has not been the case. The way that the statute reads is that the Alaska statute has established these two committees, both the Ledge Council and Legislative Budget and Audit, to include, quote, at least one member from each of the two major political parties of each house, end quote. However, the Alaska legislature has a long history of coalition caucuses and nonpartisan legislatures. As a consequence, often, as is the case with the current legislature and a good portion of the last legislature, the minority caucus has not had representation on this body. That actually, since the year 2000, since 2001, that has occurred in the Senate in at least, on the Legislative Budget and Audit Committee, the Senate has only included the minority caucus three times. And when it comes to Ledge Council, they've only included the minority caucus five times. As we know, in a state like Alaska, at any given moment, depending on how things fall out, any one of us can find ourselves in a minority caucus or a majority caucus. As a consequence, the reason we are proposing this bill is that we want to be sure that at any given moment, every person of the state is represented with the important work of these two committees. I would just add, Mr. Chairman, one issue that stands out in my mind as well as a result of the passage of Ballot Proposition 2, you are no longer required, the use of party affiliation is actually optional. And so as a consequence of that, there are clearly going to be instances where there may not even be a party affiliation associated with every member of the body. That underscores the importance of ensuring the minority and the majority are both represented on these committees. This bill does not seek to expand the role of the minority on the committees beyond the single seat that it is provided for or the membership that it's provided for under the uniform rules. And the original version of the bill actually affected our uniform rules, so we decided to take a different approach in working with your staff, Mr. Chairman, and with actually, frankly, members of the other body to ensure that it would be the least intrusive and the most reflective of the population of the state. So effectively, what we're talking about is a bill related to fairness, Mr. Chairman. I know that you are a believer in fairness, and I know that members of the committee believe in fairness as a doctrine. So in the spirit of the Caucus of Equals and in the spirit of the Senate of Equals, I bring this SB 66 before you. I'm now going to turn it over and give me a moment, please, Mr. Chairman, for a transition to my chief of staff, Mercedes Colbert, who's going to go through the very brief section on this bill. Thank you, Senator Baggage. Hello, Mr. Chairman. You can hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead when you're ready. Hi, this is Mercedes Colbert, staff of Senator Tom Baggage. And to go through version A, sectional analysis of SB 66, in section one, section one amends AS 2420-020. That statute establishes the membership of legislative council. And this section ensures that there is fair representation for the minority caucus of the legislative house on the legislative council. In section two, amending AS 2420-161, that section of statute establishes administrative services of legislative budget and audit committee. So this, what section two will do, will align terminology and establish fair representation from the minority caucus of the legislative house on the legislative budget and audit committee. And finally, section three of version A of this bill inserts a new definition of the term minority to AS 2420. That's the chapter that establishes legislative agencies and permanent committees. So that includes ledge budget and audit committee, as well as ledge council. And that definition creates a new section in this chapter, AS 2420-700, which will now clarify that a minority is comprised of at least 25% of the legislative house membership is organized and has an elected leader. Thank you. And what I'd like to do right now, if it's okay with Senator Begich, is 
Uh, first, I'd like to just ask committee members, and if you don't mind staying there for a minute, um, and I'd see if there's any specific uh, committee member questions while we have you here in the section analysis before we talk about the substitute. So any of the uh, members online, do you have any questions? It's going to wrinkle. All right, well, go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a great idea, great bill. Um, I'm really excited this is being brought forth because um, you can be a minority of one, you can be in a minority of 18 or, or, or so in the House. It's been, I've, been, I've been in pretty much every single um, segment. So I guess um, one thing I was, I was going to ask is this the effective date. I, I haven't recalled that. So one, I just want to know the effective date. Um, uh, because I know this, I, I'm on both Ledge Council and Ledge Budget and on it right now, so I don't know if that would impact, you know, this year. Uh, so that would be one. And then the second thing, just a clarification, when he comes back up, it's not that important, but when Senator Baggage was up there, when he said five and two, I wanted to know if that was sessions that people, when he said that only five times, um, uh, people were on, um, I think it was Ledge Council and three times I think he said um, legislative budget and audit in the minority if that was sessions or if that was years uh, thank you very much guys I appreciate you bringing this forth uh, thank you um, chairman shower this is quite interesting and it's so great to see everyone's faces thanks Senator Reinbold uh, Mercedes are you good with those questions or uh, would you like to defer Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rangel, through the chair. On, on your first point for the effective date, this would go in effect next legislature. So this would be impacting the 33rd legislature and uh, thereafter if this passes this year. Um, and on your second point, to clarify, uh, so we, w we went through 20 years of legislative history. So this goes back to through 11 legislatures, including the one that we're currently in. So from the 22nd legislature through the current one since 2001, um, and I believe I may say the name of the other body and committee, so if that's okay, Mr. Chairman? Is that okay, Kelly? Yes, go ahead. Just to be clear, um, so what the House, the House of Representatives has consistently included minority caucus representation over the last 11 legislatures every year uh, for the Legislative Budget and Audit Committee while at the same time only this body, the Senate, has included minority caucus members three times in the last 20 years. So that's three legislatures of the last 11 legislatures that the Senate has only had a minority caucus representation for ledge, ledge budget and audit. But for uh, ledge council, the House of Representatives has only one time failed, so that means 10 out of 11 legislatures, the House has included minority caucus representation for ledge council. While in the Senate, uh, they've included minority caucus representation only five times at 11, last 11 legislatures. Does that clarify your question, Senator? I, I think it does. Senator Rebel, you good? Yes. Thank you very much. Excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members uh, before we uh, talk about the CS? Senator, okay, good. that was a good, not a wave. Got it, Senator Holland. You're a little box now. You're not the big guy anymore. Uh, okay. Um, that being said, uh, Senator Reinbold, uh, do you have a motion available for me? Yes, just one second. Um, I believe it's Mr. Chairman. I move Senate State Affairs Substitute for Committee Bill 66, Work Order 32, LS 0410, backslash B2E adopted as the working document. Thank you, Senator Reinbold. I will eject for the purposes of discussion. Ms. Colbert, would you please uh, uh, go ahead and give us a uh, back on the record for a moment and an explanation of changes, please. I know you guys are switching out a bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're all experimenting together here in this new world. Uh, so thank you for your patience. Uh, so for the explanation of changes, this is between version A and version B. Uh, section 1 adds language to clarify the, the Senate and House minority leaders. That's the main change. The House and Senate minority leaders or the minority leaders designees, they may be members of the Legislative Council. And because we, in this new Section 1, uh, that they were now adding, we're now specifically mentioning one member of Ledge Council, so that just simply changed the number 6 to 5 in statute. But this maintains the same membership of four, 14 members total in Ledge Council. So this is just a clarifying thing to reflect that we are now mentioning, uh, now specifically listing minority representation on, on Ledge Council. 
In Section 2, this language is added to clarify the Senate and House minority leaders or the minority leaders designee may be members of the Legislative Budget and Audit Committee. So this is the same thing in both sections that applies to both Ledge Council and Ledge Budget and Audit Committee. Section 2 also likewise lists and clarifies that because we're now adding specifically another member of the committee mentioned in statute that changes the number from 3 to 2, but this doesn't change the number of members in Ledge Budget and Audit Committee. It simply keeps it at 12 total members. This is just to clarify that in statute as we are now listing a minority designee. And then finally, we're removing Section 3 from this bill that was originally in Section in Version A. So Version B removes Section 3. This is because the uniform rules are adopted at the start of each legislature and are subject to change. This section would have had the unintended consequence of codifying existing uniform rule. So this ensures that this is not creating any unintended consequences by removing that section. And that concludes changes. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. If it's okay with the Chair, Senator Begich has something to add. Please do. But just before you step up real quickly, and we can switch places there, do any committee members have questions for Mercedes on the explanation of changes? Okay. Please switch out. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to switch out. This is Tom Begich again for the record, State Senator for District J. I do want to point out there is an omission that Senator Reinbold has been able to point out, and it was an intent that there be an effective date set for the next legislature. And I noticed in our versions that that is actually missing. So it needs to be added. There needs to be an effective date established for the next legislature. It's not the intent for this bill to disrupt the functioning of this legislature. So I want to be very clear about that. That's just an error on, frankly, my part. I should have caught it. And so I would just ask that understand that that could easily be amended. That's a simple amendment that an effective date of that this act would take effect after the first date of the next legislative session. Okay. Well, we'll talk about amendments, but if you would like to, Senator Begich, you're certainly welcome to. Is it your bill if you want to put that in on the next next time it comes up? And we don't want to. Good. We won't have to ask anybody else to do that particular one if there's other things. Now that we have Senator Begich back in the hot seat, I'll open it up to the committee for the debate on the bill. If anyone has questions, let me know. And this is the weird part of the pause. You got to give it a few seconds for people to come online just in case. And I am not hearing any from anybody at this time. Okay. Seeing no further questions, Senator Begich, we're going to go ahead and set the bill aside for now and bring it back for the committee another time. We will have, I think we missed amendments. Do we have a timeline on amendments for this one? Okay. It'll be this Friday, March 19th at 5 p.m. If you have amendments for the committee, please put them in at that time. I knew there was one small part missing here. And we'll bring it up at a further time. Senator Begich and staff, thank you very much for testifying via kind of a new process today on teams, but it seemed to work out pretty good. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to present. Okay. We're going to continue on this time. We have SB 39 on the docket now, and this is just invited testimony. It's been previously heard in committee several times. And I want to be clear because I'm getting a lot of questions from folks about when we're going to have the new updated version of the bill. I remember the House was organized, you know, a few weeks ago. And so there's a lot of bills out there. We've turned it in. We are waiting to get that updated version back so we can QC it, make sure it is correct. And then we will have it posted on bases, et cetera. A lot of folks are asking and interested in the changes. So it's coming. Folks, please be patient. It just takes Ledge Legal a long time to draft at this time of the session when there's so many bills out there. So that's all. Uh, that's the only reason there's a delay. There's nothing else to it. As soon as we get it back, we're going to post it on basis. We'll put it out on social media. We'll let people see it. And then we will have uh, the following you know, public testimony, et cetera, to debate the bill after that. So it's coming. We're just not there yet. Uh, today we have invited testimony from Chris Miller. Um, each committee member should have received a PowerPoint presentation via email. Uh, the, office also sent out, the office also sent out several leaks to videos that will uh, provide background topics today. So... Um, we're going to talk about uh, in this kind of, you know, where we've discussed before data security, chain of custody, voter validation, and ballot authentication. 
are concerns, um, especially when you have a lot of mail-in or absentee um, voting. And as I've tried to make clear to folks, we're not opposed to those things specifically. We're trying to make sure that they are secure when we use them. So we're not trying to prevent them. We're trying to make sure that as we send ballots out, as we have had division of elections on the record here, um, tell us that there is no chain of custody from the time we send it out. And when the, <clears throat> the ballot comes back, we haven't tracked it. Um, and people have to call in individually if they want to find if the ballot made it back. And we accept that prima facie. And we even took it away the witness signature based on a judge's ruling uh, of her own ruling last year for the uh, general election. So um, these are things that we are working towards to try to find a better way to do things. We hope our next presenter can help our committee and the public understand elections in a different way as we work to improve the integrity of our election system and restore people's faith. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Chris Miller to the Alaska State Senate Affairs Committee. Um, please put yourself on the record by stating your name and a brief introduction, and then you can begin the presentation. And by the way, I just have to mention I'm a whiteboard guy in my previous life flying fast jets, and I love seeing the whiteboard behind you. So when you're ready, sir, please continue. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Miller. Uh, I, I'm employed by Oracle. Uh, my role is the, they call me the Distinguished Solutions Specialist. Uh, there I really have three jobs. Uh, I act as the internal control and accounting expert uh, for both uh, U.S. GAAP and also IFRS and international with respect to SOX compliance, uh, internal uh, uh, general IT internal controls, and so forth. Uh, I also work very closely with developing new products there and, and, uh, and really about how to fit a system. Uh, my, my key job is to make sure that when we run into a, when Oracle runs into a problem, uh, specifically they don't know what to do, it usually comes to my desk. Uh, so that's what I, I really specialize in. And I'm really grateful for an opportunity here to be able to talk to you about a few of the technological pieces that um, maybe will give you some real uh, key understanding of the foundations of what technology is changing and what the implications and the advantages could be for voting. As we go through here, um, feel free to stop and ask questions. I'm used to, uh, you know, as I do presentations, to have people ask and say, uh, clarify that or, or what would you do that. We'll also have some time at the end to make sure I'm, this is your time. I want to make sure that I give you the information you need to make a good public policy decision based on these technologies and have a working understanding of how they would fit in to help the voters of Alaska. Hey, Chris, a quick go ahead there, just for one yeah. moment. If you have the ability, we're trying to figure it out from this end, but again, like I said, we're kind of, we're kind of learning as we go with teams and this weird world we seem to be living in at the moment. If you have the ability to share it to the screen, just like that, either that's you or Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's Perfect. me. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was so just thanks. getting ready to start it there. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I just like to say, hey, I really appreciate a guy who knows how to use Teams. <laughs> <laughs> I, pre I appreciate that. That may be my best qualification throughout this entire thing. Is you figured out how to work Teams. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, uh, so let's go ahead and start here. I, I appreciate it very much. Uh, this is just my bio that I tend to give uh, in full disclosure since it's recorded. My wife says this makes me look like a jerk, but uh, I really it's uh, I, I do that just to kind of hopefully establish uh, some of my credentials here as we as we go through here. So Oracle requires me to just put this safe harbor statement out here. You know, I'm not making any promises on behalf of Oracle. And then a, a couple things I just want to do, since I know this is uh, for the committee. I'm an employee, but I'm not really here as, a, as an official Oracle representative. I'm not looking to sell anything. What I really want to do is just educate you guys. Uh, I used information from a lot of sources. You're going to see things from Oracle's perspective because that's what I know. But I just want you guys to know there are uh, several Microsoft, Amazon Web Services. There are a lot of really good cloud providers that would give you uh, a lot of options here. Uh, when you're making a, a choice. So let's go ahead and start. When I start to think about what would I really be looking for, this is, uh, in our regular lives, this is what we've come to expect when we do a commerce transaction. We go to Domino's, we look online, or we, look, or we go in and we expect to see a pizza tracker now. We place an order. It tells us that the order has been placed. It tells us when it's been prepped. And even beyond that, it tells us who's prepping that order for us. It tells us when it's gone in the oven, and ultimately it tells us when it's out for delivery. And so as you go through even buying a pizza these days, you're able to, to know, am I getting the right pizza? What did I order with the pizza? Who's preparing it? Is it being prepared? Is it on its way for delivery? And ultimately, will it make it here? And what I'd like to do is really talk about the equivalent of giving the voters of Alaska their own pizza tracker 
for votes. Okay, because we, if we could do it for pizza, we could do it here. And I'd like to show you guys exactly how we would do that. Whenever I'm uh, taking on a topic, I'm a big believer, you know, in the seven habits. And this is the thing from Stephen Covey always did is the three things that we always need to know is why do we need to make a change? What do we need to change? And then ultimately, how do we make a change? And so uh, these are the three things I'd like to address today as we go through it. Now, I think everybody probably has a good feel for why we want to change. So I'll really focus on what to change and how to go about doing it. Here's our quick agenda that we'll talk about. And then this is really the how, what, and why we do this. When you look at how do we create voter confidence, the idea being one voter, one vote, where when we all look at the results of an election, we feel three things. We understand that there was security and there was freedom from outside interference or any potential uh, manipulation of the results. We know that there's audibility and transparency that gives us those accurate results that we can believe in. And thirdly, what we want to do is create accessibility. The, the idea, there's an idea that you probably, all of you probably deal with in business called reducing uh, friction in a transaction. And what we want to do is be able to use the technology not to make the barriers harder, but to reduce the friction for the voters while maintaining all of these things. And I believe if we apply these systems, we can be able to uh, create just this sort of thing. Okay? So this is Thomas Jefferson. You know, that we have the government by the people who participate with the goal being here, making sure that as many people participate in our republic as possible. So here are the big five technological pieces that I'd like to talk about. And what I thought I would do is start with each of these and exactly what they do and how they'll apply to those three things of giving auditability, transparency, security, and accessibility. And those five are the pieces that you hear, cloud infrastructure, multi-factor factor authentication, blockchain, tokenization, and a digital wallet. You guys uh, probably see a lot of these words and think, man, he's, a, he's gonna get pretty technical. I will try really hard not to do that and make it, uh, if you can make this kind of stuff enjoyable for you. But the big thing I wanna emphasize is that you deal with all of these things every day in life, that these run the back office of a lot of things we do. As you go through here and you see these, you'll see exactly how we can make them fit for voting. So the first, let's talk about cloud infrastructure, okay? So one of the things that Oracle is doing, and I agree, again, Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, is we're creating these regions. Now, what I really want to focus on here is not our worldwide scope, but what I'd really like to do is focus in here on the United States. You'll see that the key here, that uh, we've created government zone uh, cloud infrastructure warehouses, which means these are going to be FedRAMP certified, they're going to be only for government, and no data is going to leave the United States. It's going to stay in Phoenix, Chicago, Ashburn, and San Jose, California, where we're, we've got one uh, planned. The reason why is because, as you, as you know, across all the countries, if you're dealing with GDPR in the EU, if you're dealing with China and their, like, their data, all of these countries have requirements that the data stays within their borders. I'm even working on a, on a sizable project with a Canadian company that wants their data to remain in Canada. And so this is a requirement for businesses all across the country. And what the first kind of core fundamental security aspect is we want to put this in a world-class data center, but we also want this data to stay in America and not, not go out wherever where we might lose contact with it or bad actors could have any access to it. Right. Once we uh, have, a, have looked at what it, where the data centers are, and where they wall it off, here's really what Oracle does very uniquely that's really strong. The first thing is that we have what we call a zero trust architecture. And that means that Oracle cannot see a customer's data. There is no way an Oracle employee can go in and tamper with your data. And likewise, we set it up so the customers can't see the Oracle code. Well, what does that mean? If you, are, if you have other people or a, within your company that are accessing it, they can't go in and manipulate the code okay, that, that would control how things are done. This is one of the ways that, that you can create this kind of security. And we'll see there are really two major databases that we're looking to create that will rely on this zero trust architecture. You can see here that we have this maximum security zones, which will just make sure that people can't make, accidentally make mistakes. Okay. When you're looking at this, uh, this type of control, these are the kind of things that you would expect as these things move to the cloud. 
uh, and, are, and are managed to, uh, in these data. You can see as we start out here, right at the end, what you call the edge or the internet, these are, think of these as the, the castle walls where we protect you from denial of service attacks, DNS security, the type of hacking that people do. You have a complete set of monitoring and logging, so you know exactly who's um, accessing things. All the way up in here until you get into the identity of who is accessing the data. Now, the reason why this becomes really important is because as we move to certain technology, they're going, we're going to see that there are really two types of informational ledgers that you want to keep. The first is what I'll call the voting ledger. How did the ballots be cast? And the second ledger that we're going to go through is what we'll call an identification ledger that says, how do we identify who's an authorized voter uh, that's on the rolls and authorized to vote and hasn't voted twice that their vote's been used? We want to make sure that we can enable great segregation of duties, but also make sure that the security here is so that people can have complete confidence in the, in the security and the controls that are in place for that. The third question when we're talking about base cloud architecture sometimes I run to is a question about scale. All right, so, you know, you have an election in Alaska. We have 750,000 voters. Let's assume that all 750,000 wanted to vote in person on one day, um, you know, part of that. Here, Oracle, and, and again, all of the other major ones can do this. On a daily basis, we, we process 43 billion API calls per day in real time. We can scale up. That's done on essentially what they say is 2,200 compute servers, and we could scale up 750 more of them in 12 minutes. What this really means is on election day, when you have a massive spike in need, Oracle is elastic enough to be able to handle that surge in demand because the common concern would be, well, what if we, you know, like when you, you know, you make a run on a, a, a store on a website, you crash the website, you can't crash Oracle cloud infrastructure. It's it, the, the scalability is off the charts. Okay. When we're looking at what you would, what would I be looking for? These are the three things that you guys really want to look out for uh, with respect to certifications. The first one uh, that's really the key one here is what we call FedRAN. I'm not sure if you got how much you guys have dealt with that, but this is the federal cybersecurity standards that are the most, I'd like to say onerous when you talk about from business, but really the highest standards in security. The, the, this is the DOD type uh, things. This is CIA. This is when you talk about here about the Amazon uh, Jedi cloud that's being done. It's being built to these FedRAN standards. In addition, there's DOD standards already baked in. And you can see here, even across other countries, GDPR for the EU, PIPEDA for Canada, and even HIPAA, which is uh, here in the United States. This, is a, this becomes important so that people will know that, that privacy is, is, you're going to be able to maintain privacy and be protected from you know, any sort of bad actors. The, the next thing, um, now once we've established kind of the foundation, this is where it's going into. Because a lot of times... I, I know when, when you look at the cloud, early on when we had adopters for accounting and financials, people would often say, hey, Chris, uh, why would I put my most sensitive data, my financial information up on Facebook for everyone to see? And what, what we, I want, what people need to, we want to help them understand is that the data that comes into one of these infrastructure warehouses is safer in Oracle's hands than it ever would be in your hands. One, because of the spread out cost, this is security that money can't buy. Um, you know, I suppose the you know the state of Alaska, if they wanted to, could create that kind of a budget, but a private citizen couldn't. But this becomes extremely cost-effective, getting world-class security for you. Uh, while in addition, you're not putting it up on Facebook for everyone to see. You're literally locking these things into you know, it's like putting it behind a bank firewall. It's like behind putting in Fort Knox here for you. The security here is something that we give people confidence in. Okay. The second piece uh, that, that's crucial is now that we've got cloud and we say, okay, we know it stays in the United States, and we know that people who are unwelcome uh, can't just hack into it, get into the database through a brute force thing. But what about the people that we're looking to uh, access the data within these data sets? Well, this is where multi-factor authentication comes from. And you guys have probably seen this. If any of you have uh, kids or grandkids that love playing video games, this is one with Fortnite. It has two-factor authentication. And this is where when they sign up, they want to give a digital gift to somebody. 
they have to essentially get a, a code on their phone or an email that says, this is really me on something they have. Over here, I buy a lot of stuff from Target. Um, and when you order something on Target and you want to go do the pickup, what they do is they, one, they ask you for your name, but then when you say it's ready, you get a little four-digit code that's texted to you and you show that to the delivery person and that becomes the authentication that you have. So one, I knew about the order. Two, I've got the order code. And that's really what multi-factor authentication is all about. What we want to do here is make sure that people that are accessing information uh, aren't reliant on just a single password. You know, um, if you're like my parents, my dad, he'll get mad because he even has to put in a password and I'll be like, oh my gosh, dad, do you understand who's out there? Uh, but other times we put a password and it gets confused or we worry about someone could access our password. What multi-factor authentication does is it relies on two types of different data for you to access the data. So in this case, think of knowledge as that's my password. Okay, so I have to, I have to know my password. Possession would mean, uh, for example, uh, a mobile phone. If you've ever gotten those text alerts that says, would you like to log in? Is this authorized? That's a possession. Inherence is something that is inherent within you. So this would be a biometric marker, perhaps a fingerprint, something like that that you would use uh, that you have that. Location, because we can track the IP addresses, one of the things for multi-factor verification here might be, um, is it an authorized voting booth? Because we don't want just people voting off their iPhone, uh, you, know, a, you know, maybe someday, but as we roll this out, no. And time, is it within the prescribed time bands? You don't want people voting after the polls close. Well, the reason why these things become important is really for two major uh, pieces here. The first is the election database that has sensitive information. One, we have the voting ledger, but two, let's say as we wanna, people wanna be able to authenticate and say, here's my ID and track this, we wanna make sure that the people who have access to this information, uh, that that can't be compromised, that they have proper segregation duties, you know, certain people can't get into certain data, but that we also have uh, so that we know about this. The second thing is for what I would call a voter identity broker. One of the things that will, that will happen as technology comes is the, the authentication for a voter ID law. Right now is really, you know, someone shows their ID, you look it up on a paper log, it's very archaic. The, the, way, the way the systems do now as we start to get into this is that we could create an identity broker system where someone could um, upload, for example, you know, upload a picture of their ID and then have a, a multi-factor authentication and being a, uh, something to their cell phone or, their, or an email address. And that way you could make sure this is the way to guarantee uh, and vastly reduce that there won't be fraud of someone, say, uh, you know, taking over the ballot for somebody else. I know that can be a common concern is if we were to use an electronic system, how do we make sure that person is really not just putting something there? And that's where this multi-factor authentication uh, comes into play. Now, I've, I've covered two of the three of the five here. I'll just pause there and see if there are any questions. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm uh, not going too fast, but I also know you, you guys are really smart, and I don't want to uh, go too slow for you either. Okay, uh, I'll pause for committee members. Anybody have uh, questions at this point? I'm good. It's very interesting. Thank you. Anybody else? Fantastic. I've got a couple I'll throw out there just to generate a little discussion. Sure. Uh, let's talk about some other countries from what you know. I made the point earlier a few times that I would be surprised if China, Russia, other countries would allow another country to have their servers or information floated there for their election systems. Are you aware? Of, say, example, like Russia or China, do they allow, and, and you kind of mentioned it, but I want to have this like more of a debate, if you will, of uh, to allow, for example, uh, American servers to uh, control the information for their election? Yeah, the, the short answer is absolutely not. In fact, it goes beyond that. They, won't, they will not allow private citizen information or business information to cross their borders either. So in China, where Oracle does do a lot of business, all those data centers for China are located in China, and we have a very similar thing where the European Union requires a, has a very similar data governance policy with GDPR that's come through that's even become more strengthened. And so not only would it be with respect to uh, this, but they take it two steps further and say, we don't want our citizens' private data or business transactions uh, flowing through to other countries as well. Thank you. Two more kind of 
question topics here, see if anybody else has one after that. We had a division of elections, um, you know, issue with uh, insecurity in 2019, and then last year in 2020, we had the division of elections. I'm sorry, I got the PFD data hack for 2019, the fund division, and then division of elections data hack in 2020. Some of the things you see here, and you've kind of illuminated them, but just specifically talking Alaska as a state that has had recent data breaches that could very easily affect our voting system as far as people's information that was floating around, how it could be used, who has their hands on it, was it a foreign entity, et cetera. Can you address how, you know, things like that that have happened to the state, that the types of systems you're discussing would prevent that from happening? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. I'll just, let me back up right here to what I'll call my, uh, my little security rainbow here and just kind of talk through the, the, the various layers that you have to do. So, a lot of times the way hacks will, will happen are really uh, from a couple different, uh, from a few different sources. The first is that they will attempt to impersonate here to get the, uh, to get the data. And so this will come from, uh, for example, a compromised password, uh, allowing someone to have admin access who should not have admin access for data not being encrypted. Those types of things are really solved here by having a good having the right tools for the correct data governance policy so what are those the first is like it, it, the first principle that you'll often hear is you want people to have the minimum uh accessibility needed to do their jobs okay so that when we set up these various tiers of security that is being managed and oftentimes uh you'll see that in in government where i deal with the segregation of duties for audit companies that can sometimes get a little bit lax if you have people where you're, you're understaffed, uh, people who don't know, and it seems very simple. Like I would like to let, for convenience, let this person be able to do this job as well, and they may seem unrelated, but they give you access where a bad actor or someone who perhaps is, is being compromised could actually access that type of data and release it. Okay, so that's where, that's the first thing. We give you the tools to enable to manage those correct segregation duties. The second thing is, when you try to compromise something, when you use two-factor authentication or multi-factor, it could be three, you you reduce the chance of failure with someone uh, impersonating a user drastically. So think about it. If someone got a hold of your password, but if they don't have your phone where the code comes from, it doesn't work. If they get a hold of your phone but don't have your password, it doesn't work. And so the, these various factors create, like, it's a, it's a multiplicative thing that to reduce your audit risk or your your hack risk now if we step out here into the uh, the extra places you'll notice here that we have complete backups root of trust sign firmware this is uh, in the idea that your your security with your server is absolutely uh things so people can't just go accessing even the machines that are on so think of it like this we have in the cloud infrastructure if you had your personal computer it would be like having uh, passwords and security to access Outlook, Word, your files. But then on top of that, here at the virtual network, this is like having your computer with an encryption password you have to put in the front. That without that, you can't even get in to try to do the other pieces. And then ultimately, out here on the outside, this is really where the people who are trying to do, where we do penetration testing. This is where, you know, you think of the, the uh, Eastern European hacker trying to, get in and steal credit card numbers or shut you down with a denial of service and shut down uh, a particular thing. All of these things are essentially for being protected and managed on the outside. So what this really comes down to is on the outside, we, we use this infrastructure to cut down outside people. We use two-factor authentication to cut, to cut down people who might be in, the, in that gray area where they have some inside access uh, but not enough. They need to compromise that. And then on the internal side, we can manage access to degree with the segregation of duties that it would really take collusion from multiple sets of parties to be able to create any sort of breach that you would have. That's awesome. I have a couple more questions. I'm going to ask you one and sure. just check with committee members as we continue so we keep moving. Uh, as we discussed multi-factor authentication, what are your thoughts on how that might work with mail-in or absentee type voting? Because obviously one of the concerns, as we have tried to address, is we don't want, and you've mentioned this as well in the briefing so far, 
is we don't want to provide more obstacles to people voting. We want to make sure that everybody that's eligible has access as best we can while securing the system as best we can. So within the scope of what we're discussing, how would you see um, you know, mail-in and absentee voting working that meet those requirements? Sure. Um, I, I'm, and that'll be, I'll, I'll give you the 30 second answer if that's okay. And then I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail uh, as I go couple, cover a couple of the other pieces of technology. If you want to wait until the, then, the, that's fine. I don't mind. Yeah, I'd on. be happy to, if that's okay, I'd be yeah, happy to do you that. Bet. Please continue to where we were then. Well, let me ask for uh, other committee members based on uh, where we are right now. Any questions? Okay. Hearing none, please continue on. All right. So let me just uh, scroll back through here and let's talk about the the third piece of technology, the blockchain. Now, a lot of times when people hear about blockchain, you think about, you know, Elon Musk, you know, punching up Bitcoin and you're like, what is it? We've got some cryptocurrency mined out of nothing, not backed by a government. So it's a fiat currency with no backing, you know, with that. And that is really where block, the idea of a blockchain started. But think of blockchain as a little bit more of it. Well, I'll talk about it. But this is the real-world applications beyond cryptocurrency where this do this. So Walmart is, is using this right now to, for both orange growers, lettuce, and various other, uh, other farmers. And what they do is when a farmer is on the farm and he, and he grows the crops, puts in the boxes to transfer it, there's a document often done when it goes to the packing house. They record that here in this blockchain ledger, okay? That becomes something that, that the farmer and the packing house now have an agreement based on this electronic blockchain ledger. The two pieces of paper are essentially recorded in, the, in this link from packing house to transportation, all the way to exporter, through, through processing, distribution, all the way to Walmart. At each step in the place as there's handoffs, these things are being tracked. Now, why is this important? It means that we could, if, if there's a lettuce recall, for example, Walmart can go back through and when they see exactly from which uh, lot that lettuce came from, they can track through the blockchain in the matter of just doing some analytics and identify the farm from where that came from and the packing house in a matter of seconds by, by crunching that. Because each stage of the transaction is, is identified, well-known, and easily accessible. And so think of this as the ultimate chain of custody thing is what we're going to use the blockchain for. We're not going to, you know, do any sort of weird uh, things, you know, with currency and there's not any sort of technological tricks here. What this is really designed to do is enable you to have a lot more transparency and security as things go through. And let me show you kind of how it does that. Um, these are some Oracle slides that, you know, we often talk about. But the real reason that, that blockchain is being used, and, and when you look at, well, who is using it? Walmart, IBM, uh, virtually every major bank right now is going to transfer banking onto these things. It's really for three reasons. There's, you, you can create a sense of trust because every party can see both sides of the transaction and there's a history. And because of that, that gives you really like a single source of truth. You can go to the blockchain if you will, the, the ledger, and see exactly what happened to those oranges or that lettuce along the way. That means people no longer will need to argue about, well, is that my fault, your fault, is that my lettuce, not your lettuce, those types of things. Well, in the context of voting, we would, and I'll talk about how we ensure anonymity and how these work in a, a little bit, but the concept of voting, the idea would be on this blockchain ledger, you could log in, and there would be two things. One, on your private account, so to speak, you could see that your vote, what it's, where it falls in the blockchain and confirm, yeah, my vote's in there. The second thing you could do is you could very quickly tabulate and see exactly what happened, the vote tabulations. They essentially become uh, almost like a public ledger that everyone can say, yep, I agree with that. This is what happened. You can data mine them for analytics. You could quickly look and see if there were any sort of uh, you know, uh, inconsistencies or discrepancies uh, that happen with that, that happen with it. And the third thing is that if it, these things can calculate incredibly fast. So right now, you can process approximately on the most complex ledger, and the and, and a voting ledger would be simpler. Approximately 12 uh, Ethereum transactions. That's one of the cryptocurrencies per second, and that's how fast it writes to a, to a block. 
Well, so that can quickly scale up to where all of the, essentially the counting can be done in a matter of mere hours with all of this ready to present to go. If the blocks are created by early voting or absentee that are counted ahead of time, then that time of processing is even reduced. The goal here is when you look at this, you can avoid unnecessary delays. And the idea here is the more this is automated, essentially through a transparent process, you eliminate a lot of manual labor, manual paperwork, and that. Now, I don't want to imply that this requires going completely digital. That's a possibility. But where we're at right now talking is like, how do we manage this paper ballots? And I'll get to that in just a moment. This is kind of what I talked about. But what I'd really like to show you guys is what really makes a blockchain work is a couple of these things right here. So if I were trying to explain it, how does it work apart from all this technical gobbledygook? Right now, if you're looking at a bank, when you're dealing with the bank, the bank has the bank ledger. And then if you're you guys or myself, and we deal with the bank and we get our statement, we have our ledger, if you so to speak, what we have and we feel we have in our account. Let's say there's a discrepancy. Well, what happens is the bank says, hey, whatever I've got, that's the source of truth. That is what's right. And you have to now go convince the bank that there's a problem. You have to be like, you got to research this and you got to go through this. The idea of a blockchain is that it's distributed amongst several different nodes. So no one person owns the entire single of truth or no one server or no particular piece, but instead it's distributed all across. Now, this is this is and what happens is, is the blocks are written. It's essentially replicated a crossover. Now, so what happens? And then this is the reason why people say blockchain is is very fraud resistant, is that as it writes the blocks and everybody gets it. If someone were trying to attempt to commit fraud or do some sort of injection and change it, they would literally have to go and change over 51 percent of the entire distribution nodes at the exact same time. If there's a discrepancy, a node A and node B and C and D say one thing and node E says something different. Well, you can bet you can rest assured node E is where the problem is. And that's where you go looking at it. Well, over here, the way it does that is this would be an example of a transaction. So let's say we were just selling something. This is kind of my my debits and credits accounting. Hold something here for a thousand dollars. And here's where it came in. And then what? And then so these are my books. These are your books. But out here on the street ledger, it's recording. Both sides are being recorded. What what accountants and financial people that are looking to use blockchain are calling this the evolution from double entry accounting to triple entry accounting. So what you'll enter your double entry on your books, they'll do it on theirs. And then the blockchain will take both of those and essentially stamp it. So you understood that what this does for you now is if there's a discrepancy, if there's a disagreement, hey, I you know this, you can go here to the ledger and see essentially how the transaction work. So there are all kinds of applications. So let's say we were looking at, you know, the state of Alaska. You guys were looking to track production data for severance taxes. This would be where, you know, that you guys would have people put in the production data for severance taxes. And then essentially that ledger would become a public ledger of what was done. Same thing if you needed to do, you know, if there's a division order and where are payments going and you want to track that. Well, a blockchain is an ideal way. Likewise, you know, land leases for recording the deeds becomes, you know, because you have an unmutable chain of custody as to who owned that land at what time, when, who brought it for. OK, same thing here with voting is the blocks are created. You can see exactly how the votes were tallied and by that have to have the auditability. So let me just move to the next slide here. OK, so on the blockchain, there are really two pieces. There are two kinds. There's permission and permissionless. So Bitcoin and Ethereum are permissionless. Any of us can go in and buy some Bitcoin, pay with something for some Bitcoin, feel like we want to invest in some Bitcoin. The second one is a permissioned blockchain, and that's where people are invited in to join the network. 
And what I would propose is that you would want to create a permissioned blockchain network if you were looking to do this for voting. Because essentially, the people who are permitted to join are uh, authenticated voters who have received a valid, uh, who have a valid ballot, making their vote at the right time. Uh, you know, in the right conditions are what are going to allow you to have that type of confidence. So let me just show you here, uh, real quick, what that might look like. Um, I'm not sure how many of you like are, are uh, invest or like to invest in Bitcoin or want to see that uh, something like that. But this is a uh, a, a mock-up of a of a token. So in essence, this is the blockchain record that you would see right here that someone would have that would that would be tracking a, that would be adding a ballot or a valid vote to the blockchain. Okay, and this is the QR code. If I come in here and I wanted to say, you know, how did that election turn out once everything once everything was released and promoted? This is kind of what you would see. I would look here and I would see all of the transactions. In this case, where I have a value of Ethereum, this would be votes. So you know, let's say uh, this is a vote for Biden, a vote for Trump. But these totals would be identified against these transaction hashes, and then you can also see the block. This is where the auditability comes in because you know every vote that made that up, and that vote then can be traced to where where it came. Now. When I say trace to where it came, that does not mean voter identity. I'll show you how we're going to protect anonymity here in the next section. But this is what enables you to say this vote voted this way and the, how these total up. If I wanted to go in and even see a little bit more, you could see, you know, as it was posted, whatever additional data. And you guys, we could really create whatever we would want here on this, in essence, for this voter wallet, if you will. The other thing is, this is where the analytics come in, into play. This is just a very simple mock-up. Uh, simple thing, but you can quickly see if I wanted to look and say, you know, what are the balances, uh, in this case, Ethereum balances, but if I wanted to see, you know, what trend, what's the voting vault, you could bind this for, hey, what was our voting volume, what, what did it look like, you know, from what locations was it brought in, and these are the kinds of things that will be immediately available for you, so, you know, exit polling, you know, kind of be damned, you guys will know what actually happened, where, what, how, uh, and that way you can better serve your, your you know, the, the citizens of Alaska by giving them what they need. Let me just switch back here to... Um, here. This is the idea of a, of a blockchain table. And the idea here is when there's no trust between people here but a provider. You know, this is uh, think of this as the Secretary of State or the Registrar. It is exactly how this would work. And this is where you want to, when you want to maintain a custom a chain of custody, this is a type of blockchain table or model that we would use. It's, it, it becomes far more straightforward and simpler to manage than creating like, like voter coin, if you will, uh, with kind of the free for all. Uh, so this is the, the advantage that like an Oracle or an AWS can help bring rather than trying to spin one of these up yourselves is you can have these managed permission processes uh, with Oracle standing behind it. Um, I'll pause there and see this blockchain is probably the most esoteric of all the, the concepts and just see if there's any questions about that before I move on to tokenization and digital wallets. Let's circle on a couple real quick, but I'll open up to the committee so far if there's any questions. What's that? This is so interesting. Thank you. Oh, I see Senator Roger, Roger Holland. Sorry, Senator Holland, you can just speak up if you do. Right now, I can't see you because of the screen. I should have said that before, so I can't oh, see Oh, sorry you. about that. Sorry, I was using my little hand on there. Yep, go ahead. Um, so, um, so this might be, so is any state using blockchain to ensure voter integrity right now? So there, there are not very many states. Uh, Utah allowed some to be used via a blockchain voting system, primarily for people overseas. Uh, military ballots are being uh, stored in a blockchain. There's not, there has not been a statewide use. Now, uh, uh, several other countries have done it. Russia has uh, done it for their election security. India has used several. Uh, there's several countries that are, that are looking at it. And pretty much each and every country, and uh, for that matter, every major company is really looking for a way to use this. But uh, as far as that, the other place that it was used was, I believe, at the Republican uh, convention. I would 
don't quote me on this because I know you guys are delegates who would know, but I believe Vote IO was used on several, uh, for both the Democrat and Republican, several of the the, the uh, internal uh, nominations for voting. Now they did it via phone, but that was that. It's a similar process here. Um, it, yeah. So this That's is good. it's we're at the beginning. Senator Holly, go ahead. I'm good. Uh, I think Senator Reinbold might have had a comment or a question. Go ahead. Senator Reinbold, did you have something? No, I just wanted to say this is really fascinating. This took a lot of work putting together. It's one of the best presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm happy to do it. Thank you for the compliment. I, I really appreciate that. Chris, a couple of questions for you here. Just and in, 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 yeah. you know, For the next one, if it, if it goes in a token, then just cut me off and go there. But um, so you mentioned there's quite a few uh, companies that are using this and, and some companies, there's a number of them that are actually working on this or they provide types of services. So generically, without speaking to who you work for specifically, because I know you're just trying to help give us an education here, not not pushing a particular company, is uh, do you think the states, and I, you, and I kind of generated this question off what you said earlier, I was just holding on to it, where you said, well, a state could come up with a big budget and do this on their own, or they could use the the services that are already provided that are in the U.S., because that's one of the things that we were discussing is, you know, U.S. equipment, U.S. servers, U.S. everything, and not letting it go outside when that has come up as an issue in the past election cycle. So do you believe that a state would be best suited to do this or even able to do it, or would it make sense not only from a budgetary perspective but based on expertise to use an outside server? And I know that could be a loaded question in the position you're in. The reason I'm asking is because I don't believe, based on things we have seen, it's something, for example, our Division of Elections would be able to take on as a task. Yeah. I'm just curious if you have some thoughts on, on, you know, kind of where the current state of things are. Like, a Yeah, a absolutely. So from, from a commercial perspective, Microsoft, uh, Azure, is what they is what they call their platform that we call uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, they call Azure. And then, of course, Amazon Web Services. All three of any one of those three vendors are magnificent at this security and the things that I've talked about and have the exact same, they have very similar capabilities. The, the biggest, there are three advantages you could get. When you look at the economics of doing this, every business um, has, is there's a stampede as there's a, as we're in this shift to going to cloud, every, almost every major uh, technological uh app coming out now is all on the cloud and the there and very 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 few are actually trying to do it their own so for example uh zoom is a is recently became a customer of oracle they have essentially unloaded their entire server farm and the entire zoom conferencing world here in the covid is running on oracle cloud infrastructure why one they outsource a lot of the expertise they get cost certainty and quite frankly, when you add up all of the hidden costs, it's, you know, it's when you see a bill, say, from AWS or Oracle, you look and go, wow, that's what you're paying. And then you think, well, I could buy servers for that and I could, you know, the electricity. But you start adding in electricity, cooling, um, all of the overhead, overhead and labor that's required, the contractor costs. Pretty soon, going with one of the, with one of the major cloud providers looks incredibly economical. Um, a competitor of Oracle's in the cloud ERP space uh, called uh, Workday, and I'm not sure if Alaska uses Workday for human resources for the state. They they, they have a lot of the states uh, where they do the payroll and all the HRIS. Workday uh, for uh, you know for all of their customers that they do everything they do is on Amazon Web Services. So when you access this Workday, what you're really doing is it's a skin of Workday and everything in the back office is running on AWS. And so I, I'm i a believer that, you know, if I was giving advice, put it out to an RFP uh, and get the, you know, make it as a competitive deal. But any either AWS, Microsoft, or Oracle will provide you a service far better than you could ever achieve on your own. They have... Uh, the skills and everything else. Essentially, Larry Ellison um, in our last meeting, he says the future of Oracle is really bent on two things: Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, which is the um, you know, and then uh, Cloud ERP, which is kind of like the cloud accounting, which is uh, where I kind of the side where I'm at, spend most of my time. That's me and Oracle Cloud Financials, and so I'm 
I know this is a long-winded answer, probably more than you wanted. I apologize. But I just uh, I found that the outsourcing cost-benefit ratio makes so much sense that this is that I wouldn't even consider uh, trying to spin it up myself. If I had a startup and someone gave me, you know, uh, seed money, I wouldn't even consider it. You know, under any circumstance, it, you would you would buy uh, you would buy the the infrastructure from Oracle, AWS, or Microsoft. Thanks, Chris. The reason I ask is primarily because cost is always an issue at the state level. We're struggling in Alaska, like many states, yep. and you know, elections, this is the struggle we have as we discuss it is we want to make this as good as we can, but we obviously are very cognizant of cost and what is the best and most efficient way to provide the level of service we need, um, the security that we believe we should have, but also be able to ensure that it is fiscally responsible. And so that's why I asked that yeah. question. And, and that's something we often struggle with, whether you contract it or mm -hmm. try to do it yourself. But I would argue, based on what I'm hearing here, that the expertise at the state level does probably not exist to do this on our own. Okay, one follow-up question, then we'll continue, because we've got about 10 minutes left or a little less, and I know I want to get you to finish, but it's germane oh. to this topic area just very briefly. Um, you talked about how you can introduce transparency and in vote tracking and ballot uh, with, like, for example, a ballot itself in the envelope. But one of the problems that we would face, obviously, is making sure the ballot remains secret and anonymous inside the envelope. Now, it's an interesting dichotomy because if you go, for example, via fax, they'll tell you right there on the website, you know, for the state that somebody might see your ballot, might see your information. Hopefully not, but they might because of how it gets transmitted. So can you briefly just again illuminate yeah. how it would work for both the transparency of being able to track but also the, an the anonym being anonymous i couldn't say that word right um through yeah. this process thank you absolutely let me walk through it here and uh, i'll get right here to the slide that shows that so the, the key to anonymity to answering your question is this idea of tokenization and so whenever you get whenever you're buying something from amazon with one click or you use like a, a apple pay or a google pay this is where tokenization comes from. And what, what is really happening here is I have your, this is your real debit card. And what, and you want to go ahead and pay for something on the, uh, you know, uh, at the gas station. What these, what the tokenization means is you, they don't get your real card when you swipe it at the card reader. What they get is this right here, uh, a complex hash, uh, like an MD5 hash or an algorithm of a number that's absolutely meaningless and can't be traced back to this. That's what's called a token. This token then comes into, and for example, this is like Square, if you guys ever used it, and this is what you would call the token vault. The token comes in, and this is under, uh, if you will, lock and key, has the, 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 uh, the Rosetta Stone of what token actually matches to your uh, correct debit card so the transaction can be processed correctly. Okay, so if you're looking at this, this is what would happen. If I was uh, applying, here's my social security number on the account, and here's this account number, what would actually be stored in the cloud that someone see would be this, a meaningless social security number and a meaningless account number. But down here in the token vault, you have the, the, the map that says, here's the real social security number, here's the real account number, and this is how they could be matched up, okay? So in a, in, I'll go ahead and skip the digital wallet since we talked about that. So in a system where we want to create anonymity, the, the way we create that is really twofold, okay? The first thing that we do is, let's say I'm the voter. Uh, sorry, my uh, mouse froze on me for a second. Just, uh, where did that thing go? Well, I apologize. I was hoping to have my laser printer pointer working, and I seem to... Ah, there we go. Okay, so if we look right here, I'm a voter, and I come in, and, you know, I'm ready to cast a vote. This is... Think of this as the voting booth interface. Now, this could be um, anything from I want to apply for an absentee ballot on the web from the Secretary of State or from the county, to I'm actually in a kiosk in uh, in, a, in the in the voting booth or uh, in the traditional line uh, there's a, a a thing like you know when you go to check in at the airport and you would check in at the airport and then receive a paper ballot that would go through. Now the way this works is I'll zoom in here so you guys can see it. Whoops. Here I hit the. Oh. 
once in a while. I can't work the thing. And this is really where the magic starts to happen. The key is that there there need to be two systems to really create anonymity. And, and this is why I've kind of everything here has led up to this with the, the security, segregation duties. The first is an identity verifier system. Okay, so think of this as I come in and I show my two-factor, I show my license, I get a text on my phone, I say, yep, I want to vote, and what it does. And so what? So when this verifies it, it creates a key, a voter key, if you will, that says this voter has requested to vote. This voter has asked for an absentee ballot, whichever type of thing. And that creates a token that comes up in here into the voter booth, uh, into the voting booth interface. And it says, this is a legitimate person, okay, uh, that, that is eligible to vote. And then what happens is without having any knowledge of who it was, uh, this the, the registrar, or think of this as the county who's actually issuing the ballot, it, what they're going to do is they're going to receive what's called a blind token. And the blind token is this. If you get one of these from me, you're, I'm not telling you who it is, just send me back the following ballot, in this case, ballot A, because this has been authenticated from the blind token. So it says, oh, got it. I push it back. Now, what you get here now is that the, 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 ex, the eligible ballot, if you will, has now been sent back to the interface. And the end result of that is really twofold. The ballot has no idea who the voter is. And the authentication system has no idea what's on the ballot. These, there's a wall between the two of them where you can keep these completely separate. And, and so the way this would work is if I went in, to, in person and let's say there was a kiosk, I would, you know, vote. It would, I would get the ballot on my screen, vote, and then get my confirmation. It could be a printout where I get that hashtag that says, here's what your ballot number was. Off I go. Um, if I wanted, if you wanted people to have a paper ballot at the point, and when this was validated, rather than having an electronic, they could just print out a ballot, and the ballot would have the hashtag on it, uh, the hash key on it, so that that would know, so it would go into the blockchain. But again, there's no linkage between that hashtag and the verification system that's happened. So whatever goes into the blockchain is going to be um, person unknown. Okay, so think of this as like when you go to the airport. The control is going to be here at the identity verification system because that's really important. This is like going through the gate at the TSA. We make sure that the authorized people are there because then once we go in, you essentially have the freedom then to go wherever you like. We're following a similar principle here where once we have identity verification that's been correctly signed, then the, the vote and the ballot is going to essentially say, okay, you say that person's good, you've gone through the gate, now you can go to any gate you want by getting the ballot. And then once that's it, and then if we do it by paper, it gets scanned through, um, and then it goes into the blockchain based on, on the hash, but we have no connection between who voted and what they voted, but we do have absolute confidence that a red, an authorized person voted who uh, identify themselves through multi-factor authentication, and we have confidence that the vote tallies were correct, and if they're not, the voter, knowing his hash as it comes out on the paper, can look and make sure that his vote it was included. So that you're going to have a lot of self, you know, I like to think of it as self-service verification, go, yep, there's my vote. Um, so I'll pause there and see what you guys think of that. Mm. Well, I hope you're an engineer to try to keep up with that. That's pretty... Uh... That's pretty in-depth. That's, I'm a, a, that's a great explanation. Yeah, I apologize. So I, that was, I know it was more techy than I wanted to get into. Unfortunately, there's not really a way to do it that's not a little geekish. No, that's okay. That's part of why you're here, Chris, to be able to explain it from the engineer perspective down to more of a, a grassroots level. Open it up to the committee. Does anybody have questions on how this works or, well, any questions from anyone? Remember, you have to unmute because I can't see your hands. Mr. Chairman, again, this is uh, Vice Chair Reinbold. I just want to say thank you. This is one of the most comprehensive I've ever seen uh, in a committee. Um, excellent job. Thank you. Uh, any of the thank other you. three senators online, any questions at this point for Chris? All right, Chris, we're going to run a couple minutes over here with the if the committee would indulge us. We got, I know you're just about done, but I want to make sure yeah, we finish it I, up. So uh, please continue. I appreciate it. Sure. 
I'm uh, I'm really on the, the last two slides. And so what I wanted to do here was really tie it together and say, okay, how would these five pieces of technology really come together uh, to, to build something? And, and this was an infographic I took from Follow My Vote, one of the companies working on trying to create this. But in essence, if you think about it, you use a digital wallet to that's where you would get your verification and use that to uh, authenticate yourself then once you in your digital world you do that and you submit this this is where you're going to use that identification system wants to be under the cloud infrastructure and have that security so that people know that when they're identified that they're that they're correctly that that everything is going to be secure then what we want to do is use the tokenization technology to make sure that the voter has been authorized to cast a ballot and using that dual purpose system of blind tokens to make sure that there's that double blind thing to create anonymity regardless of, of the voting intake, whether it's electronic, absentee, paper, in person. Once we've secured the vote, then that goes into the blockchain ballot box and that's where it's counted. And that's where the results then can be tallied and analytics can be wrote on. Then uh, when we come back via the vote account, their vote account, again, their digital wallet, if you will, they can go in there and verify for themselves that their vote was cast correctly and they can confirm the results. And then regardless, the key principle being regardless of the intake method, whether it be, uh, you know, again, absentee, mail, whatever, voter security and voter privacy is maintained. And that's really the key thing to reduce that friction. We want to make sure that we've got that. Just to kind of give you a, a last uh, uh, example here of what you're doing, this is the patent that the post office filed in August of 2020 looking to create a, a blockchain system for elections via the mail. Uh, you can see here, uh, I actually had work on this, but the same concepts that a little bit what I talked to are exactly what they're looking to patent here with respect to a mail ballot processor on the blockchain, an identity uh, verifier. And so if you're looking for who's another possible supplier or want to do this, the U.S. Post Office is actually looking to be able to create this type of security for absentee ballots or if you're a state with all mail-in voting uh, to set this up and to increase this. So in conclusion, I'll just close here with like follow up. Here's really what I wanted to accomplish, hopefully help you guys be able to make a good policy decision, is to understand, you know, how, do we, how would we do this with respect to take, combining these technologies to make a system? And what are we looking for, you know, this, how can we create security, auditability, and accessibility? So that ultimately the why is, you know, we want voter confidence. One voter, one vote with an efficient election. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll say thank you very much for the time. Uh, I appreciate it. If there's any final questions, uh, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, if not, thank you for letting me uh, share some of uh, some of these things I've learned and some of my passions, and I hope it's been helpful for you. Very helpful, Chris. This is a fantastic uh, you know, presentation as part of what's helping us work our way through to try to meet the requirements of, of what I've said before, good ballot, um, you know, election integrity. People restored their faith in the system where a lot of people on all sides seemed pretty upset the last four years. But at the, at the same time, trying to make sure we're allowing everybody that's eligible um, good, easy access to vote. You know, some of the things we have to consider in Alaska, which we've been talking about, is we've got, you know, low-tech voters. Uh, we have villages that are very spread out that don't have necessarily good Wi-Fi and other things that can be, you know, not everybody has a cell phone or even Internet access here. We're a little odd in our size and how we're spread out there. So that's things that we have to go, you know, consider as compromises perhaps with Bill with the bill for, uh, you know, allowing different ways for us to vote, which we are, of course, looking at. Um, it's interesting to talk about the, you know, U.S. Postal Service going to blockchain, something we should certainly be considering if they are, um, and that's part of what this effort is about. So you know, that's certainly something for us to look at. I would say that, uh, you know, from that perspective, this is uh, <clears throat> providing a lot of information to chew on, and I know we're going to continue to work with you on ideas and things that uh, might uh, provide the opportunity to get us there. Still a long way to go. And I'm going to open it up to the committee for uh, final thoughts here or questions uh, since we're a few minutes over. And thank you for letting us do that. From anybody? This Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, All right. This, this certainly adds uh, a lot of incredible background to why SB 39 is so good. And uh, anyway, thank you very, very much. This was fantastic.
Thank you, Senator Reinbold. I don't uh, hear Appreciate any it. other questions at this time from committee members. So, Chris, again, thank you. I know we'll be working with you more on ideas and uh, things moving forward. So thank you very much for taking the time today to call in, and we will talk to you later. You are cleared off, and uh, t have a good day. So very, very much appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you. It was a pleasure meeting you guys and uh, learn and have the opportunity to do this, and I uh, hope to talk to you again someday. We will. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank Chris, you. you still there? Sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Senator Chris Miller, where are you physically located at? I'm in uh, Lehigh, Utah. Okay. Thanks so much. Got it. Okay, uh, thanks everybody for coming online today and uh, enduring a little bit of a different uh, format here as we work our way through uh, what's happening in the building with COVID response, et cetera, et cetera, and talked about that before. Our next meeting will be this Thursday, March 18th at 3.30 p.m. Uh, we're going to be hearing SB 31 prohibiting buying caucuses. We might bring up SB 39 ballot custody tampering uh, if we have the, uh, the updated version of the bill. Uh, and then bills previously heard. Seeing no further business before the committee at this time, we're going to go ahead and adjourn. Uh, at 5.07 p.m., thanks for letting us go a little long. Pretty darn good one. Hold on just a second. Making some noise. Oh, pretty good one today. Uh, I'm glad I was able to catch all of it. Had some technical difficulties earlier, but I was able to catch the one I was live streaming. And this one was a really good one to be paying attention to, especially the SB39 that they took the longest time discussing there. Three bills that were covered today was SB95. This is basically taking all the surplus gear that would come from, say, our military and things like that, and it would go to search and rescue um, and become state property so that they would be able to have it to continue on using this stuff when it's their surplus. Uh, so big cost reduction and also it costs us Alaskans nothing to actually pass this bill saying they're allowed to use that stuff. Um, it's that simple. So I'm behind SB95 for what I've heard about it so far and uh, I'm pretty sure it'll probably pass committee by, before the day is through uh, the next time they have it. Uh, we have SB 66. This is brought to us by Tom Baggage. Basically, it's discussing how they want to make sure that the minority always has a seat at the table when our legislative sessions are not in session. So the, the Basically, the legislators that meet in between each session, we kind of got to see some of that happen this year at the very end when the Alaska House majority, the ones that were in charge of the special interest agenda, both Senate and House, the Alaska Senate majority also of Giesel and all of them, they held a couple of what I would have classified as illegal meetings to discuss the new proposed budget from our governor and uh, what they thought should be done and of course the, the meetings all ended up being about how they need to increase revenue and make sure that uh, they cap uh, make the ability for us to come out of this crisis even more difficult than what it is discussions that they should have been having years ago like cutting the budget um, they're still not doing anything that I have seen in the Senate finance or in the House finance to do anything in that direction it's all talk about income tax doubling the motor fuel tax, uh, live streamed that earlier today, and uh, different kind of, uh, you, you name it, state income tax, uh, sales tax, different items along those lines are all increasing, bed tax, you name it. If they can figure out a way to tax it, uh, they're going to see about a way of trying to increase it on top of what our cities are going to try to do on top of it. I mean, speaking of cities, Anchorage and the Muni, they are having their elections. It's happening right now. Ballots were mailed out yesterday, and there are 15 people running for mayor. There's only two that I would say I would support at this point, and that's either Robbins or Bronson. Um, take your pick. Figure figure out the the best out of the two for your own personal self. If if I was to give you a suggestion, who to vote for, and make it happen. And there is quite a few uh, conservative going for the school assembly 
uh, the board there and uh, definitely look into them. I think uh, Alildi, or it does, I can't think of the person's last name right now, is, is one of them that's out there that's running for school board. Um, I kind of, I, I support what I've been hearing in her live streams here recently, so I don't be one of my suggestions out there, but, and there's a couple of bond packages adding more hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and not that much, but you get the general gist onto what it's going to cost to operate uh, Anchorage. Those bonds have to be paid back. The way they pay those bonds back is by taxing your properties. And so all you property owners are being dictated to right now because uh, the, the ones that are getting out and filling out those mail-in ballots in Anchorage happen to be running in the category of the blue. And uh, they're, they're overwhelmingly returning in their ballots where the other side of the uh, house that is what we would classify as in some circles red um, seem to be sitting at home and throwing away their ballots in the mail and not filling them out or when they don't get them in the mail they don't contact the muni and say where's my ballot so that i can vote that's the biggest problem we have out there you need to get your ballots turned in and if you're not receiving it in the mail within this next path next week you need to be on the phone with the muni and asking them where your ballot is. I mean, the election is just next month. It's just right around the, the, the corner, and you're done by mail-in ballots only. There is no real voting polling booth to go to to go and vote. you got to do it by mail. So if you're not participating, you're part of the problem. You're the reason why Anchorage is the color that it is and running the way it is. You, you only have yourselves to blame for not getting out and making sure that you're filling out that ballot and mailing it back in or dropping it in one of the many drop boxes that you're now paying for through your taxes. Um, just to, to wake up and start paying attention, you've got the highest budgets ever recorded over the last past six years. Everything's increased year after year after year after year, and it's going to do the same thing if you don't get rid of the people that are in control right now. I can only imagine what will happen to everybody there if Forrest Dunbar becomes the next mayor of Anchorage. If you think Berkowitz was bad, if you think Austin Quinn Davidson is bad, oh, just wait. Forrest Dunbar gets put into place. Expect your property taxes to go through the roof. Expect more constricting freedoms to happen within Anchorage to where you're going to be probably like Fairbanks is becoming to where you're going to have to make sure that you don't misgender somebody accidentally and uh, use the wrong pronoun because if you do and you do that in the government you get in a lot of trouble from what I understand happening in Fairbanks so just imagine that being the that's the next step for what happens in Anchorage if you keep the the progressives that you have in charge right now all right, and uh, kind of that's in a segue into the last and final bill, which is SB 39, which is basically covering our election integrity, how our elections happen. Um, the, today was a technical overview of what it would mean for Alaska to take control over our elections to where we could get real-time data as they are processing through the machines. We know which districts have voted, how many people have voted, who has voted, <clears throat> and all of that information is being processed in real time and, and being done instantly. Um, you and, and the options that I am going for is that if they get these kind of machines that would link into this stuff, they, they would honestly, I want the ones that print out a paper ballot. We need a paper trail, no if, ands, or buts for it. We need to have that paper ballot. This is not going to be no electronic. You get a code, you carry that code number over, and you put it in. Um, you want your ballot to match what your vote is. You want to be able to take that paper trail later on and be able to compare that paper to that actual vote, not accidentally have a thumb drive that this information may have been on just up and disappear. We, we need to be able to have that paper trail so that we can have integrity in our elections. But what this also does is, is it streamlines our elections. It makes it more secure. Our voter information isn't being transferred overseas to farms overseas that are processing our votes and then sending it back over to us again. This would make it all internal within the United States, utilizing United States companies. And uh, the cost savings on this is astronomical, to be honest with you. We'll be able to reduce the cost of what it costs right now to do our elections. Um, we can also add on top of the cost of doing our elections, 
the same companies Oracle was the one that was speaking today and they can be able to pro give us processes to streamline like how we do our payroll for our government um, how are they paying all of these different divisions where is it coming out of this is a package they could build in Oracle and streamline it so that we don't have these triplicate features of, of different administrative levels within these accounting departments doing all of this work. It can be streamlined into a, a system that literally makes it, uh, the, the information is there. It doesn't care exactly where you're employed. All that information is, is stored within the computer by one individual, whoever hired them and put them into the process into the payroll. Then it's all handled through one office, uh, very simply to consolidate everything small investment up front to, to get the program up and running but once the program is up and running we can get rid of those typical triplicate positions that are out there it's just just a suggestion that was made there <clears throat> and I'm expanding on it a little bit because I really did like the idea of what I heard there um, he also made suggestion of maybe the United States Postal Service is working on an idea for how to do ballot counting and all of that other good stuff and uh, honestly I don't want our ballots to be touched or handled by anything that has to do with the United States Postal Service. Um, they are a government institution. Why would I want the government in the, in my opinion, they are a government institution. They're paid by our taxes. Why would I want them to continue to be in business of handling who we elect and who we vote for? I mean, you heard the Democrats screaming voter suppression, voter suppression. Look what Trump is doing to all of our Postal services out there. He's removing machines not telling you that these things are outdated and they're upgrading them to faster more uh, Efficient equipment that makes 10,000 times less mistakes those kind of things. They didn't say all that stuff They're just he's removing these machines those kind of things um, Why I, I still don't understand why there would be any support for that to ever have happen But again, this is a lot of technical that was there uh, explaining the security level actions happen 113,000 people here in Alaska had all their voter information stolen from the state of Alaska because of their insecure server system. And uh, we didn't get notified it until a month after the elections were already over saying, oh, don't worry about it. We didn't detect any voter fraud. But, oh, by the way, all of your voter information for you 130, 13,000 people was stolen. Here's a letter to let you know that. If you think something may have gone wrong during the election that may have compromised your vote, well, if you didn't vote and you really don't care and someone else voted for you, how are you ever going to know? Because nobody questioned what was going on. This is still a big red flag here in Alaska that is getting no answers and nobody but us alt media are asking any questions in that direction. Um, SB 39, this is a, a, like I said, a very, very comprehensive breakdown of, of the geeky, they, they quoted it there during it, you know, this is the very geek tech, technical about how the back end of securing our elections here in Alaska uh, would happen. Um, a very a, a comprehensive uh, review there that uh, unless you are a geek, which I just happen to be also, um, I understood just about everything that they said there. I don't think there was anything that went over my head in what they were describing. Um, uh, that has a lot to do, thanks, you know, to my background in some areas that I've worked in my life. Um, what else can I say about it? Uh, not much. SB 39 is definitely worth uh, watching the entire video. You got SB 95, which was for like the search and rescue, being able to utilize surplus materials that come, say, from our military, and they can get it to use within their own. It's at no cost to the state. You got SB 66, which was the bill that Tom Begich had put forward to basically give the minority a seat at the table for the legislators that remain in session when actual session in Juneau is over with so that they always have one of the minority at the table. This bill, personally, and I made a comment about it in, during the video and put, had, had put it down in the comments anyways, this bill basically reminds me of what we're seeing going on around the country is that the Democrats no longer are in the majority. They don't have this year. This is one of the first years in decades that we actually don't have rhinos in control of the agenda in the Senate. 
It's been a very long time since that's happened. They, they still control the Senate finance, but they don't control the rest of the Senate where a lot of the agenda is getting pushed through right at the moment. And that is a, a positive in that the, this bill is designed because they are worried they're not going to have a seat at the table. Mind you, this bill is not set to go into effect until the 33rd legislative session, so it would not affect the next two years. That's supposed to be one of those, oh, I want to make you feel good about it. I am seeing bipartisan support for this bill, though, but it's very disconcerting, in my opinion, and people need to really pay attention to the language of what is being used there. I see it just as another political lever to make sure that the minority, um, which always seems to be who's in control of the majority anyways, is always in power. So. All they're doing is just saying, oh, well, this one minority member that's already a minority is just going to come on over. Like the last two years, it was the Senate Democrat minority. It's this year, it's no different. It's the Senate Democrat minority. The only difference between this year and the last two years, the last two years, the rhino Republicans that were voted out of office back in November um, were in control with the Democrats pushing the agenda forward. This year it is the Republican Party, the conservative side of the House, that is pushing the agenda forward. And unfortunately, like I stated already, the main ones in control of the Senate finance are the same ones that were there for the last four years. So there is, is no exception. It's, it's, we're looking at uh, kind of like a rinse and repeat with better control on all the other departments that are going on. Like, share this video, Facebook squeals on you if you don't, especially if you leave a comment down in the comments. And go to my website, politidic.com. Make sure that I have time to be availability to be able to live stream these things. Otherwise, I have to go out there and work for a living and uh, actually earn a, a, so that I can be able to put food on the table and keep my lights turned on. I would rather be here reporting on the politics in Alaska and trying to live stream and, and catch as much of the stuff that is happening within our state as I possibly can and the only way I have the ability to continue to keep doing that is, is if you my followers help support by going to my website politidict.com click that support button become a monthly subscriber they can be as, uh, as low as five dollars a month and uh, all that money goes right back into expanding what we're doing we have grown from nothing more than making comments on uh, the the post of other people to where we have now running our own website. We've upgraded our cameras, we've upgraded our microphones, we've got uh, our own uh, Politidic TVs to be able to live stream from to all of you. We've upgraded the computer system so that they can actually communicate with each other, not 12 year old archaic things. Our next goal is, is to want to be able to live stream to all channels at the same time. But all of this unfortunately takes money and I've never been a rich person. I just take what I get and I put it right back into whatever I'm doing, just like I'm doing here. Everything that comes into Politidic goes right back out into Politidic to continue paying for all of this stuff, to be able to pay for the monthly fee of the cell phone that Politidic now owns, uh, phone numbers on the top of the, the Facebook page. So it's all these different things that you guys have access and ability, and as we keep growing, as you keep helping us grow, we keep expanding what we're able to do throughout the rest of the state and provide it to all of you. Have yourselves a great afternoon, and I will probably see you here in a couple days.